Hello, Booktube. This is day seven, uh, part seven of uh, this massive book haul. Um, got a stack here. Uh, I may not be able to get through all of them, but uh, we'll see. First one is another sort of archaeology, Egyptology book. Um, it's uh, another sort of, I think, English publication that has yellowed pages. It's uh, The Keys of Egypt, The Race to Read the Hieroglyphs by Leslie and Roy Adkins. Used to have this in Canada. Um, it's a really good book. Um, it's definitely... Uh, we'll take another read. This one is because some faded on the spine. Um, it is Harper and Collins, uh, 2000. When Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798, his troops and scientists were astonished to find ancient temples, tombs, and statues all covered with hieroglyphs, the last remnants of a language lost in time. The discovery of the Rosetta Stone raised hopes that the mystery of hieroglyphic writing could be uh, solved. And as Egypt mania spread throughout Europe, the quest to decipher the hieroglyphs began in earnest. Uh, fame and fortune awaited the scholar who uh, succeeded. Uh, in rural France, Jean-Francois Champollion, uh, the brilliant son of an impoverished bookseller, was obsessed from childhood with unraveling the origins of mankind. At that time, the most readable, reliable evidence for the creation of the world was believed to be the Bible, and he began to learn languages in order to study the original Old Testament texts. When he realized it might be possible to read equally the ancient Egyptian texts, he found the challenge uh, to which he would decide his life, or dedicate his life. The Decipherment of Hieroglyphs. Uh, it's a very good book. Uh, it's well written. Um, so I probably will reread again eventually. Um, here's another media studies book. Uh, TV this time. The Lucky Strike Papers. Journeys Through My Mother's Television Past by Andrew Lee Fielding. It's a revised edition. Uh, Bear, Manor, Bear Manor uh, Publications, um, which uh, 2019, so it's a brand new one, pretty well, quite new. Um, they are they do uh, media type stuff, TV, uh, old time radio, um, silence, uh, and, and they they publish books that normally would fall through the cracks, and that nobody else will do. Uh, this year is, uh, is sort of, I think it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it, it's about his mother and, uh, her, I think her, um, well, anyway, let's read here. It says, in 1951, a critic in Downbeat magazine wrote that Sue Bennett was one of the coming female singers in the country, uh, writing that she had the controlled musicianship of Joe Stanford and the jazz, ideas of a Sarah Vaughan. Bennett was a featured singer on several network shows during the TV's early years, including Kay Kaiser's College of Musical Knowledge, The Freddie Martin Show, and Your Hit Parade. Decades later, Andrew Fielding began exploring the period of, of live television via the shows uh, on which his mother sang. His resulting portrait of the era which includes conversations with early television luminaries as Dorothy Collins, uh, Snooky Lanson, Raymond Scott, Merv Griffin, uh, Arthur Penn, and Kay Kaiser uh, is both enlightening and captivating. Um, so yeah, so early television and um, sort of a memoir about his mother. So that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, here's another... Oh, it's a novel. Didn't realize that. Okay. Um, yeah, because when I read here, um, read something here, yeah, uh, about the book, um, it, it didn't make sense to me, but uh, now it does being a novel. It's a novel of silent film era. Um, 
So we'll see. Uh, it's called Another Side of Paradise. Sally uh, Coslow. Uh, it's Harper. Uh, Harper Collins. Uh, this is his first edition. 2018. In 1930... Oh, no, it's not silence. In 1937, gossip columnist Sheila Graham stars on the rise while literary wonder boy F. Scott Fitzgerald's career is slowly drowning in booze. But the once famous author, desperate to make money, penny scripts for the silver screen, and charismatic, is charismatic enough to attract the gorgeous Miss Graham, a woman who explores the secrets of others while carefully guarding her own, like Fitzgerald's hero, J. Gatsby Graham, has meticulously constructed her, her life far removed from the poverty of her childhood in London slums. And like Gatsby, the one-time uh, gutter snipe learned early how to use her charms to become a hard-working success. She is feted and feared by both the movie studios and their luminaries. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so yeah, well, it's, yeah, with uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald as well. So could be interesting. It's uh, worth a read. Um, hired pens. Hmm. Professional writers in America's golden age of print. Ronald Weber. That sounds interesting. Uh, let's see here. It is Ohio University. Um, 1997. Uh, Hired Pens tells the story of the class of uh, full-time independent professional writers. The, let's start that again. Hired Pens tells the story of the class of full-time independent professional writers who emerged in America in the 1830s and 40s and flourished during the great age of print that began after the Civil War and continued into the 1960s. While most accounts of the writing life focus on high culture artists, higher pens, hired pens treats authors who uh, pursued the shifting popular tastes of Grub Street. Likewise, um, it treats a literary marketplace that includes not only novels and poetry, but gift annuals, story papers, general circulation magazines, dime novels, pulp and slick magazines, newspaper syndicates, and paperback originals. Um, so yeah, so that sounds interesting. I've got stuff that's sort of similar on British. Uh, so this will be um, a nice sort of companion with the American side to it. Another uh, naked hardcover. English language and literary criticism. Ambrin Safter Caribbee. I've um, never heard of this public. Oh, it's uh, oh, it's a Indian publication. Yeah, Discovery Publishing House, India, and it has that look to it of uh, Indian publication. Uh, first published two thousand and nine. English language and literary criticism is part of curriculum for the students studying English literature. Attempt has been made to trace the origin. And uh, structure of English language and has examined literary theories and its approach to literary. The book is divided into three parts, consisting of origin, development, influence, and structure of English language. Uh, part two deals with the introduction of literature, literary criticism, its evolution and function from the days of Plato to Aristotle. Part three explores the major contemporary theories in his prose to literature. Dr. Caraby is working as a lecturer in English at Samadaya College for Arts in uh, Dewandi. So it looks like it's, it's probably more or less a textbook for um, Indian students uh, learning English language, so uh, English literature. So, yeah, interesting, but uh, only partially so. Ah, here we go to another one. Um, 
Indian English Literature, a critical casebook. Ramadrath Data. Uh, it'd be best if I just show those. Uh, this is, oh. A bookmark. Uh, Roman books, yeah, that's uh, from the publisher. Roman books. Um, 2012. Published in the UK. Uh, this groundbreaking collection of critical ex uh, essays, anthologies, extensive critical discussions on every major issue of every major text of Indian English literature, ranging from the classic uh, Raman Hohan's Wife uh, to the postmodern's Midnight Children. This book is an indispensable companion to the readers of Indian writings. In, in English, investigating the Indian elements, uh, pre, pre, uh, investigating the Indian elements present in each text, this book uh, not only focuses new light on the thematic, social, or cultural uh, issues of these literary texts, but also enables the readers to rethink the position of the entire genre of Indian English literature from an international and broader intellectual context. So it's got novels, poems, short stories, and drama. That's kind of interesting. Um, Want to know anything about uh, uh, Indian literature? That could be quite interesting, actually. A reference book. Ah, you know, here we go. After the Whale, Melville in the Wake of Moby Dick, Clark Davies. The University of Alabama Press, 1995. After the Whale contextualizes Herman Melville's sh uh, short fiction and poetry by studying it in the company of more familiar fiction of the 1850s and 1890s. The study focuses on Melville's version of the purpose and function of language for Moby Dick through Billy Budd with a special emphasis on how language in function and form follows the follows and depends on the function and form of the body, how the a attitude toward words echoes the attitude towards flesh. Um, must be a reprint because there's a uh, it's 1995. It just says that the recipient of the 1993 Elizabeth A.G. Prize in American Literature. So, yeah. So, more literary criticism. Um, yeah. Romantic and Victorian Long Poems, A Guide, Adam Roberts. Uh, it's a Rutledge, uh, it says uh, Revival, so it must be a reprint. I think I'm not familiar with Rutledge. Yeah, reissued 1999. This was reissued in 2018. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Rutledge Revisals is an initiative aiming to reissue a wealth of academic works which have been uh, long been unavailable, encompassing a vast range from across the humanities and social sciences. Yeah, so and. This, I'm assuming, there's no description of the book itself, but it should be, yeah, just, it's a, it's a guide for romantic and Victorian long poems. Um, it's an introduction, and then main author and title list. So, yeah, so it's... Yeah, so it's it's almost like a dictionary type thing. So that's quite interesting. Good reference. Uh, the Comfort of Strangers, Social Life and Literary Form, Gage McQueenie. It's 
Oxford University Press book, 2016. In most accounts, literature of the 19th century compulsively tells the story of the individual and uh, interiority, uh, but admits the newly dense social landscape of modernity with London as the first city of one million inhabitants, this literature also sought to represent those unknown and unmet strangers, focusing on the ways that both Victorian literature and modern social thought responded to an emergent society of strangers. The Comfort of Strangers argues for a new relation between literary form and the social dense environments of modern modernity. Uh, insisting upon strangers in these works not as alienating fearsome um, fearsome others, but a relatively banal yet transformative fact of everyday life, the dark matter of uh, the 19th century social universe. Hmm. Could be quite interesting if it's readable. It's not too academic. Uh, here's one that's still sealed. Again, there's a few of those. I see, so I'll up on it to keep it closed. Traveling Economies American Women's Travel Writing Jennifer Bernhardt Stedman. It's Ohio State University Press two thousand seven. The black and white women travel writers whom Jennifer Bernhardt Stedman investigates in traveling economies astonish modern readers with their daring stamina and courage. Uh, that these women travel at all is surprising. Nancy Prince uh, spent nearly a decade as an African-American member of the Russian Imperial Court. Amy Morris Bradley went to Costa Rica as a governess in hopes of saving her health and finances after years as an impoverished teacher in Maine. And Julia Archibald Holmes carried the banner of dress reform in the heights of uh, Pikes Peak and to the pages of a feminist periodical. So, yeah. So, study of women um, travelers. Travel writing. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so I'm hitting a vein of literary criticism, so this is a bit boring, maybe to some. Uh, some of them, is, these are interesting. Uh, Chicago and the Making of American Modernism. Cather, Hemingway, Faulkner, and Fitzgerald in Conflict. Michael E. Moore. Um, it's Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury Academic, 2019. Again, a relatively new one. Uh, it seems to be part of something historic, historicizing modern, modernism. Modernism. Chicago and the Making of American Modernism is the first full-length study of the vexed relationship between America's great modernist writers and the nation's second city. Um, oh, I said Michael, it's Michelle. Michelle E. Moore explores the ways in which the defining writers of the era, Willa Cather, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, engaged with the city and reacted against the commercial styles of Chicago realism to pursue their own European influence mode of modernist art, drawing on local archives to the <coughs> excuse me uh, to illustrate the uh, drawing on local archives to illustrate the literary culture of the early 20th century Chicago um, this book reveals the important new dimensions in the rise of American modernism. This is Michelle E. Moore, is professor of English at the College of DePage, USA.
don't know where that is. Um, so yeah, so pretty heavy duty literary criticism. Uh, here's one that's without a jacket. Oh, huh. this could be interesting um, for uh, Mark Richardson. Um, I think on his Instagram, he put up uh, um, Morrison's uh, uh, European Discovery of America. And this might be something that might be interested in going with this. It's uh, the Armature of Con Conquest, Spanish Accounts of the Discovery of America, 1492 to 1589, translated by Ling... Ling uh, Lydia Longhurst Hunt. Uh, it is uh, 1992, original, yeah, 1992 is his original printing, 1992. Um, so it's a later printing. And is it just, is it, I think it's translations of original text. Yeah. With some contextual information. Original covers and so forth, maps. Um, or is it? Um, I'm not sure if it's original documents or not, because I'm looking through and it's talking about. Uh, no, it might be um, talking about the Sp uh, Spanish and then uh, essays on specific ones. Huh. Mark Twain's Homes and Literary Tourism. Hillary Iris Lowe. Nice looking look. I... Hartford, Connecticut, I think it is. Uh, I was at uh, his house one time. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's is sort of off the, somewhere that way or that way, uh, just not very far away. Um, many years ago, <laughs> 25 years ago, probably, 2025. University of Missouri Press, copyright 2012. Uh... A century after Samuel Clemens' death, Mark Twain uh, thrives. His recently released autobiography top bestseller list. One way fans will celebrate the this the true first American writer and his work by visualizing any number of Mark Twain's uh, destinations. They believe they can learn something unique by visiting the places where he lived. Mark Twain's home and literary tourism untangles the complicated ways that Clement's house now museums have come to tell the stories that they do about Twain and in the process reminds us that the sites themselves are the products of multiple agendas and in some cases unpleasant histories um okay so that's kind of interesting there are Photographs and illustrations. Let's see here, just looking at the introduction to literary homes in the United States, the many birthplaces of Mark Twain, Hannibal as hometown, the right stuff, Mark Twain, material culture in the Gilded Age of Museum. And scholars as tourists. Hmm. That's a nice etching. Um, yeah. Kind of an interesting topic. Oh, okay. Big book here. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, a reappraisal. Dennis J. Conlon. Methuen. 2015. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, 1874 to 1936. 
was one of the most important literary figures of the early 20th century and is now almost forgotten. A recent suggestion that uh, he should be elevated to sainthood has <laughs> renewed interest in him, uh, as have accusations of anti-Semitism by critics of the suggestion. From a modest start with a job in publishing and as a book reviewer, Chesterton went on to achieve a massive reputation as journalist, novelist, poet, playwright, and much else. Born into a comfortable middle-class family, Gilbert and his young brother Cecil and his sister Beatrice, who died in infancy, their father Edward, an estate agent, ensured his sons received a good education at St. Paul's School. Gilbert then went to Slade School of Art, but left after one year. So this is a big book. Um, well, well, it's not as big as it uh, looks. It's just over 400 pages of text uh, illustrated. Um, I've got some of this. Oh, that's kind of nice. They've got a, a band in there. Um, yeah, I've got uh, some of his journalists and book reviews, which are really good. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't like the cover. Uh, another one of these naked hardcovers. Uh, Sensing the Past, Hollywood Stars and Historical Visions. Jim Cullen. Uh, it's got uh, Daniel Day-Lewis from uh, Last of the Mohicans. I don't know. I thought it was a horrible film. All it was was him running. That's all it was. If you want to watch Daniel Day Lewis run through a forest, then watch the film. <laughs> uh, this is Oxford, uh, 2013. Um, how do perceptions of the past, not just particular events, but of the trajectory of history as a whole, shape our experience of the world? Sensing the Past tackles this question with an unlikely source of historical insight. The work of six major Hollywood stars, Clint Eastwood, Daniel Day-Lewis, Denzel Washington, Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, and Jodie Foster, uh, by focusing on the career choices made by these iconic actors. Really? Uh, Colin, uh, Colin uncovers a discreet set of historical narratives uh, revealing the surpassing ways historic historical forces shape our understanding of the world. An interesting idea, but um, I question um, the people that he's choosing. Well, not so much uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, but the rest. So, yeah, I don't know if it's something that I will keep even for my film, even though it's film. We'll see. Oh, this this is so way left off off the wall, sort of. Uh, radio and the gendered soundscape. Women in broadcasting. Wait for it. Women in broadcasting in Argentina in Uruguay, nineteen thirty to nineteen fifty. Perfect period, but. <laughs> A book on Argentina and Uruguay uh, broadcasting? Okay. Uh, I'm up for it. <laughs> That's a Cambridge University Press again. Uh, stamp damaged. Um, shop return. Uh... Yeah, the radio and the gendered soundscape women in broadcasting in Argentina, Uruguay, 30 to 50. Uh, Christine Eric from the University of Louis Louisville. Yeah, Louisville. Uh, 2015. This book is a history of women. This is this book is a history of women, radio, and the gendered constructions of voice and sound in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Montevideo, Uruguay. Through the stories of five women and one radio station, this study makes a substantial theoretical contribution to the study of gender 
mass media and uh, political culture and expands our knowledge of these issues beyond the United States and Western Europe included. Uh, here is a study of the first all women's radio station in the Western Hemisphere, an Argentine comedy known as Chaplin in Skirts, an author of titillating dramatic serials, and of course, Argentine first lady Evita, uh, Evita Perón. Uh, through the concept of the gendered landscape, this study uh, integrates sound studies and gender history in new ways, asking readers to consider both the female voice and the history of sonic dimensions of gender. Um, it's not too much on sort of theory, then it could be quite interesting, just the history part of of the radio in Argentina. So I'm up for it. Uh, let's see here. Ooh. Ooh. The Anglo-Saxon world. Kevin Crossley Holland. Boydell Press. Uh, good press. Um... First published in 1982, reprinted in 1994. Uh, it is almost a thousand years since the Anglo-Saxons were shattered at Hastings, yet the society and extraordinary cultural accomplishment will always have a double fascination for us. They were the most sophisticated people of their time, producing poems, illuminated manuscripts, jewelry, and other artifacts of the very highest order. And they're our own ancestors. We owe to them something of our characteristics, attitudes, and institutions. The Anglo-Saxon world introduces the Anglo-Saxons in their own words, their chronologies, laws, and letters, charters, and charms, and above all, their magnificent poems. Most of the greatest surviving poems are printed here in their entirety. The reader will find the whole of Beowulf, uh, the Battle of Malden and the Haunting Elegiac Poems. Uh, here uh, is a, wor a word picture of the people who came to these lands as pagans subscribing um, to the Germanic heroic code and yet within 200 years had become Christian to such effect that England was the center of missionary endeavor and for a time the heart of European civilization. Kevin Crossley Holland places the poems and prose in context with the skillful interpretation of the Anglo-Saxon world. His translations have been widely acclaimed, and of Beowulf, Charles Cosley has written, the poem has at last found its translator. Uh, the illustrations draw on the splendors of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and jewelry and a wealth of archaeological finds. So, yeah, this is fabulous. Um, this will go with, uh, is it Oxford or a uh, great big Anglo-Saxon poems book? So, yeah, there's photographs. Um, uh, artifacts. No color. So, we'll say manuscript stuff would be, be nice if it was color, but oh well. No, um, yeah, so that's, I'm quite pleased with that. That's perfect. Uh, and the last one here for today. Uh, uh, still long. Uh, health and sickness in early, Amer in the, Amer er health and sickness in the early American novel. Social affection in 18th century medicine. Marine uh, Tuthill. It's a little paperback. Nice cover. It's one of those Paul Grief uh, series. Um, Paul Grief, 2016. This book is a study of depictions of health and sickness in the early American novel, 1787 to 1808. Uh, these texts reveal a troubled tension between the impulse toward social affection that built cohesion uh, in the nation and the pursuit of self-interest that was considered central to the emerging liberation of the new republic. Good health is depicted as an extremely positive social value, almost a prior condition of membership uh, to, in the community. 
characters who have the glow of health tend to enjoy wealth and prestige. Those who become sick are burdened by poverty and debt or have made bad decisions that have jeopardized their status. Bodies that uh, waste away, faint, or literally disappear off the pages of Americans' first fiction are resisting the conditions that all that all them as they plead for their right to exist. Uh, they draw attention to the injustice, apathy, and greed that affect them. Hmm. As I say, I do like these um, series. But, um, not sure which series is Paul Greaves Studies in Literature, Science, and Medicine. Okay. Again, that's not one I'm that familiar with. But uh, there we go. Oh, I got my water bottle that I use. An old Pepsi bottle. <laughs> oh, still with this side here. There we go. Um, yeah, so there ends uh, part seven. Um, yeah, there's still about another three or four to go, I think. Uh, anyway, I'll see you next time, BookTube. Thank you.